Lab number eight is entitled DC Power Supply and Regulator. In this lab, we're going to take the AC wall outlet voltage and convert it into a DC source. The way we're going to do this is with a circuit called a half-wave rectifier. Remember earlier in the course, we talked about an ideal diode, and you can think of it really as a two-valued resistor. When current wants to flow in this direction, from anode to cathode, we've got a very low resistance or a short circuit. When current wants to flow in this direction, we've got a very high resistance, Think of that as an open circuit. Suppose you've got an AC source here. It starts out, goes up, goes down, and it repeats itself every period. So when the input is positive, current wants to flow in these two resistors in this direction, but because it's flowing in this direction, we really have zero in series with R sub L. So this shorts the input to the output, and so the output looks like the input. When we go negative, current wants to flow in this direction. They've got the series combination of two resistors. But this resistor looks like an open circuit or infinity, so no current flows. So the drop across this resistor, R sub L, is just going to be 0 times R sub L. It's going to give us 0 volts. The average value of this sine wave is the integral of the waveform over a period divided by the period. But the area underneath this curve is positive, underneath this curve is negative and, and equal, and so when you add them up, you have 0 divided by the period. Now in this half-wave rectified result, we've got some area here. We've got zero area here. So we've got now this divided by the period, something that's non-zero. So we've been able to go from an average value of zero to something that has a non-zero average value. In fact, we can even calculate the value of this as an equivalent DC source. In electronics, use an uppercase letter and an uppercase subscript to indicate average value. And again, that's one over the period, integral of the function, uh, dt. So for the first half period here, what we've got is just V sub s maximum sine omega t. For the second part of this, the remainder of the period, we've got zero. So the integral of that is just going to be equal to zero. Omega is 2 pi f, or 2 pi over the period, and we could bring this V sub s maximum out here. And if you recall from calculus that the integral of the sine of ax is minus 1 over a cosine of ax. So we've got a minus sign, and then the reciprocal of this, which is t over 2 pi, and then the cosine of the same argument. Let's evaluate that from the upper limit minus the lower limit. So I've got t over 2 and I've got 0 here. Now in front I've got the period twice, so these cancel. Also here I've got this canceling with this and this canceling with this. And so I've got the cosine of pi, which is 180 degrees, and that's equal to minus 1. And then I've got the cosine of 0, which is equal to 1, but I've got a minus sign here. So I've got a minus 2 in here. Minus signs cancel, the 2 cancels, and I'm left with v sub s maximum over pi. So the average value of this waveform is the maximum value here divided by pi. Of course, here it's equal to zero. Now, if you were to use this as a DC source for the power amplifier we had built in last lab, you'd have a rather odd sounding result because for part of the cycle, we have zero. This would make a thumping noise in the speaker. What we need to do is to smooth this out or try to hold it constant if we can. You recall in the course, we've been talking about a capacitor, and indeed it does just that, holds the voltage, doesn't want to let it change. Suppose we start out again at the origin here, where the voltage is zero and then starts to increase. Think of initially this as having zero volts across it as an initial condition. Just think of this as a resistor, and so current would want to flow in this direction, so the diode would be a short circuit. So I've got all of V sub s across the capacitor and across R sub L. So the output's just following the input. The current that's flowing in this capacitor is equal to the capacitance times the derivative of the voltage across it which with the short circuit here is just equal to V sub s. The slope here is positive, we're putting current in the capacitor, so we're charging the capacitor up. When we get to the top here, the slope is equal to zero. And that means that there's no current flowing in here. So we've got a voltage present, got current flowing, but now it's just going through the resistor. Just a little bit farther in time, the slope changes here, and so current wants to come out of the capacitor, but it can't go this way, it can only go this way. We're going to get a discharging of the capacitor. And of course, we'll describe this as an exponential function with an initial condition and decaying exponential term. I kind of dragged out here in this picture because I'm going to pick this product of R sub L, C sub L, a fairly large number. But this is really the piece of a long, very long exponential. Okay, while this is going on, the voltage here is dropping at a much slower rate than it is over here by picking the very large RC product. In just a little bit instant in time, I've got the voltage here dropping more than this has dropped. This is at a higher potential than this is, so that keeps the diode turned off. And all we've got just is a discharging capacitor, until eventually the input catches back up to the output. Now when this voltage here is slightly bigger than this, 
that starts to conduct again. Just think of this as a resistor, and if this potential is higher than this one, got a positive drop across it, and that's going to make the one capacitor to charge again in this direction. So as we go back up this positive slope, we recharge the capacitor. So we've given up some charge over a very long period of time. We're actually replacing it in a much shorter period of time. So what you're going to get is a spike of current through the diode. This can burn out the diode if the spike's too big. But the process repeats itself. Discharge, charge it back up again. So now what we've got is a much smoother waveform than we had before. This is still an audible noise, and we're going to try to get rid of this in a, another page or so. We can also calculate the average value of our waveform for this new one. Let's just take a look at it in steady state. What I've got is a voltage here, and I've got a, a lower voltage here. We're going to call this difference the ripple voltage. So this is V sub S maximum minus peak to peak ripple. We can actually calculate the size of this ripple and shown on the next page. Take the maximum plus the minimum and divide that by 2. So you get 2 V sub S M divided by 2 and then half of the ripple. That's effective DC value. So we've actually changed it from the, from the previous calculation that we've done. You can think of the ripple voltage as a, kind of an AC voltage. Of course this is our DC voltage. You can actually draw an equivalent circuit of this, where I've got the average value plus or minus half the ripple. So what I've got here is something that's going to go up and go down by half the ripple. The ripple is the same frequency as V sub S, which in this case would be just 60 hertz. This is audible in our power amplifier, so I need to get rid of this rippling of voltage. We're going to do that with the thing called a Zener diode. A zener diode is like a regular diode, except that you can pick the turn-on voltage. So instead of this being like 0.6 volts or 0.7, we can actually pick something like 6 volts or 12 volts or a lot of different values. So I'll put my zener diode across my load. This is going to force a constant voltage, so I need to drop the difference between the capacitor voltage and the zener voltage across the resistance. If I don't, I'll burn the zener diode out. You can think of the zener diode just like a battery whose value is V sub Z. In the lab, we're going to make this a 12 volt zener. Let me show you a little bit how this thing regulates the voltage. Suppose that the DC value is about 17 and a quarter volts, and the ripple is 2.5 volts peak to peak. In other words, plus or minus 1.25. Suppose I've got a 330 ohm resistor here, and then I've got my 12 volt zener, so current's going to want to flow in this direction, so I'm going to forward bias that diode, and I have an R sub L here, just varying values. So as you're playing music, effectively, this is the uh, effect that you see in the power amplifier. Suppose this is 1000 ohms and that this is varying with time, but let's look at it one instant in time. Suppose that this is exactly 18 and a half volts. So 18 and a half volts here, rise in voltage, would equal this drop plus this drop. Call the current in here I1, and of course the voltage here is 12 volts. So I can solve for I1. It's going to be 18.5 minus 12 divided by 330. That's 19.7 milliamps. So 19.7 milliamps is here, but what's the current in here? Well, it's the 12 volts divided by 1K, or 12 milliamps. So what's left over for the Zener is about 7.7 .7 milliamps. Suppose the load now changes to 2.2K. Well, this equation here doesn't change. It's still 18.5 volts, let's say at one instant in time, I1 times 330 plus 12. So I still have the same current in here, but the load current now is 12 divided by 2.2K, which is 5.45. So what's left over for the Zener is 14.25 milliamps. So what's going on here is that there's 19.7 milliamps in this resistor when this is 18.5 volts. And depending on the load, as the music's getting louder and softer, I'm going to be taking a piece of that 19.7 milliamps. And what's ever left over just goes into this Zener diode, which is acting like a battery being charged. Now, this is varying in voltage, but the voltage across here is the same as long as I have more voltage here than I have here. So the minimum here is going to be 17.25 minus 1.25. So that's going to be 16 volts. It's larger than 12. So I always going to have current flowing in this direction. So even though this is varying here, what I've got is a fairly constant voltage across the load. Now the wall outlet's a 170 volt sine wave, and most electronics can't withstand those voltages, unless you're using vacuum tubes. So we're going to use a, a thing called a transformer. Uh, this has a series of windings on one side, a series of windings on the other that are magnetically coupled. Ideally, the voltage here and the voltage here have a relationship that depends on the number of turns of wire. So if we take the ratio of the primary voltage to the secondary voltage, it's very close to the number of turns on the primary divided by the number of turns on the secondary. 
This is an example with some numbers. Suppose you have the wall outlet, which is a 170 volt, 60 hertz sine wave. And suppose that the ratio of the primary to the secondary is a factor of nine. So in other words, for every nine turns of wire here, there's one turn of wire here. We're going to be stepping the voltage down by a factor of nine. The 170 volt sine wave becomes about 18.9 volts. This is very close to what you're going to be seeing in lab. So our first step is to step 170 volt sine wave down to an 18.9 volt sine wave. And then we're going to use our half wave rectifier and Zener dial regulator to turn this into a 12 volt source. In this lab we take a look at rectifiers which turn an AC voltage with an average value of zero into a voltage with a non-zero average value. We're going to add a capacitor to smooth out some of this variation. And then we'll take a look at further reduction of ripple with a Zener diode. The concepts that we covered were transformer turns ratio, half wave rectification, half wave rectification with a smoothing capacitor, and a Zener diode shunt regulator. We're going to be using some of the auto measurement features on our oscilloscope to measure average voltages, peak voltages, peak to peak voltages, and frequency. We're going to use the math functions of the scope to differentiate a capacitor voltage so that we can estimate the amount of current that's flowing through our capacitor and, and hence our diode. And this is lab number eight, DC power supply and regulator.